and welcome back. My name is Ashley and I'm a mom of two little girls. I have a five-year-old named Kylie and I also have a three-year-old named Mia, both of whom I have been raising with Montessori principles since infancy. So it's been a little bit of time. I've learned some things along the way and that is going to be the focus for today's video. Me sharing some of these things that I've learned, almost kind of like the things I wish somebody would have told me when I first got started. So before we dive in, I just wanted to share a really quick, exciting announcement. And that is the fact that I have a new pre-recorded class available over on my Teachable School platform. For those of you who have been following my channel for some time now, you already know that I have several e-courses on Montessori at home from birth to 36 months, as well as an entire course dedicated to positive discipline parenting. But it's been a hot minute since I did anything over there. And I recently ran an almost two hour session, I don't really know what to call it, um, over in my private online community, um, the Montessori Parents Mighty Network. And it was all about navigating sibling struggles. So it was originally a live Zoom session that I hosted with a small group of members over in that community, but I really felt like the content was just too good not to share with everyone else. So I went ahead and recorded the session and I have now made it publicly available over on my Teachable platform. And again, it is called Navigating Sibling Struggles, which is a topic that I have become very fluent in the last couple of years having two children at home. So I will put a link to that brand new pre-recorded class down below if you are interested in checking it out. Without further ado, from one busy parent to another, let's talk about five lessons that I have learned after five years of Montessori parenting. All right, so lesson number one is that practical life is the core of Montessori parenting at home. Now, if you are new to Montessori, you are probably very invested in checking out all of the social media that you see related to the setup of a shelf in your house, the actual physical play space with all of the different activities, carefully curated toys, things like that, and like what it looks like, you know? But practical life is a huge area of Montessori in the classroom and especially at home. And I say that it's the core of Montessori parenting because A, it's what you're doing around your house every single day. It's all the little mundane tasks and chores that you just have to do in order to live. Things like dishes and laundry and mopping and sweeping and cleaning and you know repairing clothes and washing the car and going outside and mowing the grass and doing yard work, gardening, like anything that is just normal everyday life. That's practical life. So it would make sense then that that is kind of what you are always going to fall back on throughout the day every single day. These are the kinds of activities your children are going to see you doing when they're little. They're very likely going to want to imitate you. Um, I have lots of videos that I have put out on ideas for practical life activities that you can start when they're as early as just, you know, the tiniest of toddlers, even older babies. Um, I'll put some links to those in the description box down below if you need some ideas to get started. But really, I say it's the core of Montessori parenting because Practical life is something you're going to come back to over and over again as your children grow. You know, there are some very classic Montessori toys and activities that your children will grow out of. They will eventually become too old for them because they learn how to do them. They've mastered them. They don't find them challenging enough anymore and they're ready to move on. Whereas with practical life, they're essentially skills that they start out just kind of learning the very basics of, and then they build on those skills. And the older they get, the more refined their movements become, the easier these kinds of tasks are, are for them to do, but then they can do them in more refined ways. And they ultimately end up being really helpful if they've had a lot of practice when they're younger in kind of learning how to do these things, they can become really helpful around the house. And if that is a part of your family culture from as early on as possible, then it's just natural that your children are going to be more willing and able to help you out with these kinds of everyday chores around the house. And you may find that some children really kind of gravitate towards certain areas of practical life. Like maybe they're really interested in getting themselves dressed, but they don't want anything to do with, you know, folding laundry. 
um, or maybe they really love helping you out in the kitchen, but they have no interest in learning how to independently dress themselves when they're younger. And that's okay. Kids are different. They're unique individuals. And we just kind of have to respect that and go with the flow. We obviously make the opportunities available as we know they're ready for them. But if they're really expressing a disinterest in certain things, there's no need to push it. But the point is, these really are, if you think about it, skills they're gonna have to learn anyway and skills they're going to use for the rest of their life. So even if your child isn't interested in a certain thing at a certain age, that doesn't mean it's always going to be that way. And they are eventually gonna have to learn how to fold their own laundry and put it away and help out with the dishes and maybe help with meal prep for dinner time for the family and things like that. They're eventually gonna have to learn those things. And you know, you never know when that time is gonna come. So you're just kind of always at the ready as a parent to introduce those things as soon as they start showing interest. And then finally, I think one of the biggest benefits of practical life really existing at the core of Montessori at Home is that it's not exactly an area that requires a ton of materials. Maybe in a classroom setting, yes, because in a classroom, oftentimes these kinds of activities have to be set up in kind of like an isolated way on a tray. Whereas at home, they're inherently a part of your child's environment. So there's not really much of a need to go out and buy all kinds of things because they already exist. They're there, you use what you have, what you've been using this whole time since before your children came along. Now, yes, of course, sometimes it's easier to have like smaller child-sized things, but you don't need to have all the things. And oftentimes children just make do with, like I said, what you already have lying around. So it's mostly just about inviting them in to be part of the process and then just going from there. Now, the second lesson that I've learned is that some kids just aren't into certain kinds of toys or activities, and that's okay. I think there's a misconception that just because a toy or an activity is Montessori, that it suddenly implies that a child will magically be interested in it. And I have to let you know, Montessori does not equal magic, okay? I, I know I wish that were the case, um, but it isn't reality. You know, some kids just, they're super into puzzles, for example. They love puzzles. They will just spend hours and hours working on puzzles and they just can't seem to get enough of them. And then there's, you know, this other kid over here who won't touch a puzzle with a 10 foot pole. They would rather be doing, you know, like gross motor related things, or maybe they love to cook in the kitchen. Like kids are all different. And sometimes I think we really try to fit them into a box of what we think a Montessori child should be doing. Or we try to force them into liking an activity that we've spent a lot of time preparing for them because we don't want to see our efforts go to waste. But really it's just not, it's not doing it for our child. And that's okay when that happens. You know, you can't always get it right. And I think it can be helpful to think of it in terms of like, what if this thing wasn't Montessori at all? It wasn't a Montessori toy or activity. It was just some random kid toy that was given to you by someone that you didn't even ask for. And your kid wasn't interested in it. You probably wouldn't even think twice about it. You wouldn't push it on your kid. You'd be like, eh, yeah, he's not really into it. And that would be the end of it. But Suddenly, when things are a particular Montessori toy that we were really hoping they would like, or you know, it's a Montessori style activity, and we see other kids in Montessori environments doing it, suddenly it's like our perspective shifts and we think, well, they should be doing this because it's Montessori, but it's not like that. So I think what it comes down to is trying to remember not to put that kind of pressure on ourselves, not to put that kind of pressure on our children into thinking that they should be doing it or they should like it just because we want them to or just because we think they should be because that's not fair to our children. Okay, moving on to the third lesson, which is to borrow DIY or buy your Montessori materials secondhand whenever you can for two really big reasons. One is the fact that all children are different as we just talked about. So you never know what your particular child is going to be interested or not interested in. And then the second reason is they might only use some of these materials for a very short window of time because the materials themselves are designed to cater to a specific developmental urge that your child has. And once they have moved past that period of life, 
they've mastered it, they're going to move on to bigger and better things. And sure, you might pull it out of the closet a couple of months down the road and your kid might show you know, a little bit of interest in it because they remember it. Maybe they find a new way to use it that they didn't use in the past. But ultimately, there's a pretty good chance that they have mastered the skill that that activity or toy was designed to help them to develop and it's not really going to hold their interest for a long period of time. They're not going to be super engaged in it like they were when it was developmentally appropriate. And so it just doesn't really make sense. Now, if you're going to have multiple children, then of course, hold on to some of the things that you have purchased or made because you can reuse them with children down the line. But the unfortunate bottom line is that a lot of Montessori materials, especially if you are homeschooling, are very expensive, like the pink tower, for example, or the brown stairs. These items are large, they're heavy, and if you get them, you know, high quality, like you would want to, they're going to be pretty expensive. And so your better option would be to buy them secondhand if you can find them, to borrow them from maybe a Montessori parenting friend if you are lucky enough to have any nearby, um, or to just DIY some of them. So some ideas for you there are to repurpose some of the materials that you have around your home, maybe with some things that you were planning to throw in the trash or to recycle, maybe you can upcycle it so that you can create your own version, your own little replica of the classic Montessori toy that you have in mind. I actually have a video with some really great ideas that I did a very long time ago, um, all about DIY at home Montessori activities. And I will link that video down below for you. And one of the first ones that I actually did was to create an object permanence box using a bunt cake box that was pretty sturdy that we had received as a housewarming present shortly after we had moved into our home. I upcycled it and used a little bit of hot glue and some extra cardboard that I had lying around just to, you know, get it just right. Um, but I spent all night one night making an object permanence box in my kitchen and we kept it for a very, very long time and it got a lot of love. And let me tell you, my children did not know any different. You can also try browsing around some of your local thrift stores for Montessori materials or things that could be used in Montessori activities. I actually have an entire video where I went to a local thrift store and did exactly this so that you could kind of see the thought process behind it and what kinds of materials you could potentially look for. So I will link that in the description box down below as well if you haven't seen that. And there are thrift stores out there like Once Upon a Child, for example, that specialize in selling children's clothing and toys and accessories. So you're more likely to run into Montessori inspired materials or at least some toys that align with Montessori principles, um, actual Montessori materials I have found as well in my own thrifting adventures. So definitely something to consider because if you do happen to score on the day that you're there, then you're going to get some really great Montessori things for your home at a much cheaper price tag. If you're a member of any Montessori Facebook groups, that is also a really great place to ask around, see if there are any other parents who have things that they are willing to let go. Um, you might also consider looking just on Facebook Marketplace or apps like offer up and let go. Um, if you are part of a local toy swap group, maybe there are some other Montessori minded parents that have things they can swap with you, things like that. Now, the fourth lesson is to stop worrying about what other kids are doing and pay attention to the child in front of you. It is enough to drive you crazy between all of the milestone charts that you receive every single time you take your child to the doctor's office for a wellness checkup, having to stop and think about whether an activity is age appropriate, hyper-focusing on academics way too early. I'm talking, you know, ABCs and one, two, threes in the toddler years, not necessary. It is just, it's just too much sometimes, really. And then you have the added problem of social media. So you're on there in your free time, scrolling through Instagram, watching YouTube videos, and you're seeing what all of these other kids are doing. And then you're looking at your child and instantly making that mental comparison. Well, my child's the same age and they're not interested in doing that or they can't do that yet. Or, you know, when is my child going to get to do that? Will they ever want to do that? It's just this constant comparison, it's nonstop. And like I said, it's enough to drive you crazy and you don't need to do any of that. The child in front of you is going to give you all of the answers you need if you will just take a moment to turn all of that noise off, to tune it out and just observe. 
and your child will show you everything you could ever want to know about where they are or where they're headed, what they're interested in, what they're developmentally capable of, what skills they're working on right now if you just sit and watch and listen. You know, amid all of this craziness, it's very easy to forget that children are unique individuals. And that is the backbone of this whole Montessori parenting thing, is respecting our child for who they are, meeting them where they are right now. So what we really need to do is to stop rushing our child, exercise a little bit of patience, and just wait wait for our child to show a very obvious interest in learning how to do something or waiting until they are in a very clearly established sensitive period for a particular thing before we introduce it. Like the introduction of alphabet letters around the age of three or mathematics around the age of four. There's no need for toddlers to be doing these kinds of things because they're not developmentally ready for those kinds of things yet. And that's why they're not interested in sitting down and doing them. And some parents just are racking their brains. Like, why won't my toddler sit down and practice these, you know, sight words with me? And it's like, it's, it's just crazy. As I have always said, and as I will continue to say, every child develops differently. So what you see other kids doing is not necessarily going to be what your child is doing. Your child may be ready for something long before others. They may need more time than other children for certain things, or they may never be interested in them at all. See lesson two that we discussed before. So I know it can be a tall order sometimes, but we really just have to learn how to like tune out all of that static and just zero in on our unique child. And if you do that, you can't possibly go wrong. And finally, the fifth lesson is to get outside with your children as much as you can, because it's good for everyone. Dr. Montessori talked a lot about this in her writings about having access to the outdoors and learning how to care for the outdoor environment and spending time in nature. But yet I feel like in modern day talk about Montessori, especially on social media, this is an area that's often overlooked because everybody's just focusing on the shelf, you know, the perfect shelfie and all the toys and the activities. But the great outdoors offers so much more than a shelf can sometimes. And being outside not only benefits our children from a cognitive perspective, but also just in the range of sensorial experiences that are naturally available without any preparation required on your part. Also from a social emotional perspective, a health perspective, it's, it's healthy to be outside getting vitamin D and fresh air as opposed to cooped up indoors constantly. Um, and then also just in the sense that we want to cultivate um, a sense of personal stewardship toward the earth in our children that they will carry forth with them into adulthood so that they have a desire to take care of the planet because they've spent time out there and they have a natural appreciation for it. I'm gonna get off my little soapbox here, but being outside is incredible for your children. And it's also really good for you too, for, for all the same reasons. And also kids tend to be really engaged when they're outside. They slip into independent play very easily. And so sometimes it can give you a little break too, as a parent. All right, now I know I said there were going to be five lessons, but I do have one little like bonus tip slash lesson. It's a small one for you just to remember um, after watching this video. And that is the fact that you don't have to do it perfectly in order to be a Montessori parent. I'm, I don't know anyone who is a perfect Montessori parent. I think we're constantly striving for this this perfection, this end goal, like when did it finally all, when did all the pieces fall into place? And it was just like, ah, now I can sit back and relax and enjoy the fruits of my labor. And I don't think that that's realistic. I don't think that that day is ever going to come. Being a Montessori parent is being on a journey with your children for the entire duration of their lives. So I think it's certainly a good goal to aim for, but I don't think that it is, um, an expectation that you should place on yourself because that will only lead you to being sad that it never actually happens, if that makes sense. So just 
find joy in the day-to-day -day imperfections and know that there's always tomorrow, you can always try again, you can always aim for better next time around, and that that's okay. Okay, friends, so I really hope that you found some value in these five lessons that I've learned after five years of being a Montessori parent. If you did, then please be sure to give this video a thumbs up. And if you'd like more practical tips and advice for implementing Montessori at home with your children, then you might also consider subscribing to my channel. This way you don't miss a new video. My book, The Montessori Home, Create a Space for Your Child to Thrive is now available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook on Amazon and in all major book retailers. I also have several e-courses, and as I shared with you at the beginning of the video, a brand new pre-recorded class on navigating sibling struggles available. I also have an online community that is just for Montessori parents where I do live group coaching sessions once a month. And for anyone who is looking for some more individualized support, I do also offer private coaching sessions. So links to all of those resources are in the description box down below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.